speech language therapist at Summers Therapy Services. Welcome to part two of our foundational webinar series, Talk With Me. So this Talk With Me series is a continuation from our previous webinar. Um, so we have launched the first part of the Talk With Me series in July, where we have covered four different areas of speech therapy. So we have covered pre-verbal skills, language, AAC, and speech. And this time round for part two, we are covering another four different areas. So we'll be covering play, oral motor, feeding, as well as fluency and voice. So for those of you who have joined us previously, welcome back. Thank you so much for taking the time to join in. Um, we hope that this sharing would be beneficial for you to support your child as well as for your own learning. And for those of you who have just joined us today, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you're interested in looking at the um, videos from the first part of the webinar series, We'll be putting up a link in the chat box that will lead you to our YouTube channel where you can access the videos. All right, so without further ado, let's start. Today, we'll be talking about play. So before we start, I would just like to share a quote from an internationally renowned child development expert, Dr. Karen Purvis. She said that it can take 400 repetitions to create a new synapse in the brain unless it is done with play, in which case takes 10 to 20 repetitions. So how amazing is that? That impact of, that, that great impact of using play as an approach to teach a certain skill and to create that synapse in the brain. All right. So today we'll be looking at the importance of play. We'll be discussing the different stages and types of play. And also um, we'll be looking at the five key components to consider when we are trying to work on and develop your child's play skills. So if you have any questions in the webinar, please feel free to send them in the chat box or the Q&A section. And we'll be spending some time at the end of the webinar to discuss as many questions as possible. So what is play? So we know that play is fun. Play is something that children do for enjoyment. But play is also a universal language of childhood. It is true play that children learn to understand each other and make sense of the world around them. So play is the work of children, is the primary occupation of children. Basically, a child's job since birth is to play. And when they are playing, it's child-directed. So it's what the child wants to do is not what we want them to do. And this is so important because children learn best when they are in charge of the activity, not we direct them to do the activity. So when they are in charge of the activity, they learn better. And what does this mean for us? It means that we as adults need to follow their play and join in their play, so follow their lead. We really need to follow their lead, follow what the child is interested in. Um, that's when you get that joint attention, that engagement going, you build trust, you build relationship with them, and then you can guide and scaffold their learning. But first, we need to follow their lead and follow what they're interested in. So it's directed by the child. 
And play is made up of intrinsically motivated activities. So it's something that is internally motivating for a child to do for self-amusement and self-enjoyment. But little do they know when they are doing that for kids, it's purely for self-enjoyment. But when they are doing that, it actually has um, social rewards, that's behavioral rewards and psychomotor rewards. And the best thing about it is that the rewards come from within the child. So it's not something that we put on them. The rewards come from within them. That's why it's so motivating for them. And when they are playing, they are paying attention to the process rather than the product. So what does this mean? So in this picture right here, the process of building that tower rather than the product of the tower itself. So when they are building that tower, that process of building it together, they are learning different skills. So they're incorporating motor skills, sensory skills, cognitive skills, visual perceptual skills, even language and social interaction skills. So if you look at the picture right here, um, if we look at motor skills, let's say, um, the child has to learn to grasp onto the blocks and to know how to stack it up. Um, so we work on fine motor skills as they grasp into the, onto the blocks and that um, muscles of the fingers right there. They look at visual perceptual skills that say they have to know and look at where they're placing the blocks. How do I balance it? So the cognitive part, um, problem solving. Mm, if I'm going to put the blocks in another way around for this triangle, if I'm going to put it in the corner at the sharp edges, it will fall. How do I problem solve that? Um, I need to build a a foundation here with the bigger blocks before I stack on the little blocks up here. Problem solving. And they also work on developing their creativity, so a lot of imaginative skills. So for example, um, so the block, the tower right here can be anything that the child is imagining. So for example, if this girl right here might imagine that this tower can be um, Princess Elsa's castle and this boy right here might imagine that this tower right here is an airport control tower let's say and when they have different thought processes of how do I build this tower which block goes first I want the green before the red no I don't want the castle I want the tower I want to build an airport control tower and that's when they practice um, their social skills, so negotiation, negotiating with their peers in order to play cooperatively. They practice conflict resolution. So can we come to an agreement to play cooperatively? We are going to build this tower, okay? We're going to build it up until the end before we push it down. So following the rules uh, where to play together with their peers. And I think the main thing that I really want to point out here is that play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning. But for children, play is serious learning. Through that process of playing, they're actually learning lots of different skills. And it's for us as adults to actually join in their play to help to adapt that play in order to target the skills that we are working on with them. So now that we know what is play, the next question is, why do we play in speech therapy? So some parents come in and they look at our therapy session and they might think, why do you always play? Oh my, what? what? Um, my child just play in, in session. So how do we actually target on the skills if we are playing? Why do we even use this approach? So there's numerous reasons why we use play as an approach and why we play in speech therapy. 
First of all, play is meaningful. So play is meaningful for children. And when we use play to teach um, different sounds, different words and concepts, those new skills become relevant to a child's life. For example, if I want to teach them different sounds like, the, let's say this cow right here, this cow toy right here, and I teach moo or the cow eating and go mmm, or as they eat, um, different words like cow, cow sleep, cow eat, concepts, for example, like I can hide the cow um, in different parts of the room and they can work on concepts like oh, the cow is under the table, the cow is on the chair, uh, they can work on uh, it's a big cow, it's a small cow, it's a black cow, it's a brown cow, let's say. Um, there's three cows and um, so different concepts, different words, different sounds, and it is meaningful. So when it's meaningful, it promotes retention, it promotes generalization and learning. So this is what the literature said, that meaningful experiences promote retention, generalization and learning. That's why we use play. Another reason that we have mentioned before is that play is internally motivating. So let me ask you this question. How often does a child lead you to a worksheet or an activity book? So how often do you have that? Yeah, some kids might like it. Great, we can give them all the worksheets they want. But for most children, their motivation is to play and to learn to play. And when they're learning to play, remember we talk about the rewards come within them. So the motivation comes from within them. So this is what makes play an ideal way to teach. And research have also shown this, that symbolic play is highly correlated to language development. So what is symbolic play? So symbolic play is the use of an object to represent another object. For example, I can uh, take a block here and pretend that it's a car. So I'm actually pretending, representing the block as a car. So that's when children learn that uh, language is abstract, like how when they are using the block, it can have abstract meaning, like it can be a car, it can be something, maybe food that you can pretend to feed the doll with it. So um, that's symbolic play. And, um, and research has shown that when children start to use um, one step of that symbolic play, uh, that's often where they start to use uh, single words. And when they are combining two symbolic play actions, for example, um, let's say I take the block and feed the cow, um, or I take a ball, I roll the ball, then they start to learn to combine two words into a short phrase. So for example, cow eat, ball go, ball boom, ball fall down, for example. And so by playing, we are actually encouraging language development. And another reason why we play is play is spontaneous. So play can happen anywhere with anything at any time of the day. So this means that we as adults can help children to develop speech and language skills or any other skills that you're working on with your child. 
anytime. So be it at home, in school, whether they're in the car or when you're out and about, you can work on those skills together. And the great thing about it is we can guide them to target those skills using things that they already own at home. So um, personally, this is an area that I've learned as a speech therapist since working at uh, summer therapy services. So in my previous workplace, it's all center based. And before the opening of um, our center here at summer therapy services, mainly our services are um, home based therapies where we will travel to um, the students' homes. And, you know, when we are traveling, there's so much that you can fit into your backpack, right? Like I can't bring all the toys um, to, to travel around Singapore. So um, I have to limit the amount of toys that I bring um, to the homes. And especially now with the whole COVID situation, um, because of hygiene purposes, we just try to use whatever toys and resources that the child has at home. But really, it's, it's really easier said than done. Um, it's really a mental shift um, where you really need to... So I would encourage all of you to do this. Look at the toys that you have at home. You have to uh, familiarize yourself with the toys. Try to think of the different ways you can manipulate and adapt the toys so that you can adapt it like on the spot to target the goals um, that you're working on. When you're looking at the toy, also think of the different words that you can do with the toy. Um, so different ways of using it, different words that, and different concepts that you can do with it, different activities you can do with it. So when you think about that and you really sit down and familiarize yourself with the toys, um, it comes easier and more efficiently uh, when you're thinking about, oh, how do I adapt this? How do I um, work on whatever skills that I'm working on with the child uh, using the toys that we already have at home? So that's just a personal point of view. And lastly, um, play is fun. That's why we use it as an approach to teach. Um, and research has shown that having fun is linked to learning. So if you look at the literature, they, they say that if when we are having fun, our brain actually produces dopamine. Um, in the brain's reward system. And this actually improves memory, attention, creativity, and motivation. And that's why we play. Now that we have gone through the importance of play and why we play, um, let's look at the different stages and types of play. So when I look at the stages and types, so let's look at stages first we'll be looking at two different aspects, the cognitive aspect and the social aspect. So when we look at the cognitive aspect, the term cognitive uh, simply means the, mm, the mental processes in the brain. So for example, the ability to think, to understand, to process and retain information, your reasoning skills, your problem solving skills, um, predicting what will happen next. So all of these are cognitive skills. And when we look at the social aspects, we'll be looking at more of the interaction part. So whether um, be it interacting with adults or interacting with other children. So those are the social aspect part. And it's very important to bear in mind that uh, the cognitive and social aspect is interlinked. So um, we need to look at it holistically. And when we uh, talk about types of play later, we'll be talking about the different um, play activities that we can do with the child. So I'm just trying to uh, let you know what's the difference between the play stages and the play types. Okay, 
So let's look at um, the play stages. Let's look at cognitive development first. All right, so if you look at this table, it shows the different stages of play that children are expected to develop at certain age. So I'll be describing a little bit more about how the different play stages look like. All right, so um, do take note that each child develops differently, so everyone is unique and each child develop at their own pace and their own time. So this is just a rough indication of when most children demonstrate the skills. So our role is to figure out where they are and uh, aim to develop the next stage in the play development. So for example, if your child is at cause and effect play, you might want to work on next developmental stage, which is functional play, all right? So in the early stages from birth to 12 months, so the first year of a child's life, they are engaged in play that are more um, physical. So babies first explore objects around them with their bodies. So they first um, explore their own bodies and um, try to make sense of it. And then they explore the objects around their environment uh, as they increase that awareness to their environment. And that's called exploratory play, where they're exploring objects with their bodies. So it's a kind of play where children use um, different senses to explore the object. So senses like their vision, their hearing, touch, smell, taste, uh, movement, let's say, um, and that's when they learn through that, um, exploring through that different senses, they learn the different textures and the different functions of the world. And that's when they develop um, their vision, their hearing, um, skills like their hand-eye coordination, their body movements, so gross and motor skills, and their sensory and perceptual skills. So um, let me give you an example. Um, for, so for example, if I were to give this ball to a baby, let's say, and maybe I hover this uh, in front of him or her, first he might look at it and his eyes are tracking, so the visual part comes in where he look at the object, if I shake it, there might be a sound, so the hearing comes in. Um, and when they start to develop their, um, their gross motor skills, so babies, maybe they start to flip and they start to sit up and then they start to reach out to the object and that's when they can grasp the object. Oh, how does it feel? How much pressure do I need to put in order to hold it? Um, how uh, can I eat it? So the taste part, um, and they also they also shake it to make a sound, for example, um, and that's when they start to as they explore, then they start to be more focused in the actions to get a response from the environment. So that's cause and effect play at around nine months. So uh, babies might first, you might see them just looking at it, maybe hold it, bang it, um, put it in their mouth, um, maybe throw it as well. And then when they have a response from the environment, for example, the, um, if I shake, there will be a sound. So there's a cause and there's an effect. If I throw the ball down, mommy will pick it up. If I throw it again, mommy will pick it up again. Um, so if I bang it and then daddy will go, <gasps> no, no. So that's when they develop um, cause and effect as well as being more intentional uh, in their actions, more purposeful communication right there. That's when they develop intentional, com when they have communication intent and they are more purposeful in terms of um, communicating with people around them. So making some 
doing a certain action to get a response from their environment. And that's when we as adults, we will model sounds or words for them to learn from the model. So if, if you bang, then you go, ah, oh, oh. So they know that I'm bang again, then you go, oh, oh, and they learn that model. So the next stage is, um, so let's look at 12 months to around five years old, where children develop, um, that's when they start to develop pretend play skills. So they start by doing functional play first. So at around 12 months, children learn to uh, socially use, um, use familiar objects in a socially appropriate way. So for example, they know that the ball, I can throw the ball, I can roll the ball. Um, they know that cup is for drinking. Um, it's something familiar that they always see. I know that spoon is for eating. Uh, I know that comb is for combing hair. So that's when they understand the function of the object. Um, and that's why we call it functional play. All right, and around 18 months old, that's when children um, start to do pretend play with the toys. So doing pretend action using toys. So for example, functional play, they might start with maybe um, using familiar objects and then pretend play. Um, for example, it would be something like, there's no food on the spoon, but they are pretending to eat. There's no water in a cup, but they are pretending to drink. So they're doing pretend actions with toys. And that's when they do pretend play. And at around two years, the play sequences become longer. And normally the sequences are sequences that you can see in familiar routines. So daily routines, for example, like if they always see mummy uh, cutting the fruit and then putting on a plate and then feeding them, they might do that. Um, they might do sub object substitution. So just now we talk about symbolic play where they represent, they use one object to represent another object. In a, another term, we call it object substitution. So they are substituting one object to another object. So I might pretend that the spoon is a telephone and I put it in my ear and I go, like that. So they can pretend that way. Um, so that's symbolic play. And at around three years old, um, they'll do, that's the emergence of imaginative play. So they're acting out familiar activities and events and some fantasy play. So imaginative play, um, What's different from symbolic play is in the sense that, for example, um, symbolic play, I am still pretending with a tangible object, um, but imaginative play, I might just imagine that I'm holding an object. For example, I can imagine that I'm eating just by doing this gesture. I can imagine that I'm combing hair. Right, so that's imaginative. And imaginative can also, not only objects, but also uh, maybe I can imagine that I am in a shopping mall and I am buying something from a shopkeeper. So there might not be an adult and a child there, but they can pretend that, okay, um, someone is pressing the cashing machine and then they're buying the food and all that. So they will um, act out that sequence of events. And at around four years, it becomes more extensive. So they do narrative play. We also call it small world play where they are creating various scenarios. So it becomes very long sequence, very extensive. Um, they can pretend to have different roles as well in the play. So for example, they might be starting with um, being a chef in a restaurant and they are pretending to uh, prepare food for the customers. And then, um, then they pretend that they're the customer and they are eating the food. And oh, oh, oh dear, I'm having a stomach ache. The food is yucky. There's germs in it. 
oh dear, what do I do when I have stomach ache? So there's predictive thinking and problem solving where they need to think, oh, I need to see a doctor and reasoning skills. Why do I need to see a doctor? Because I need to get medication to cure my stomach ache. So things like that. So lots of lots of um, sequences and becomes very expensive with various scenarios. So that's cognitive play development. Um, now let's look at the social aspects, so social play development. So notice that the table is similar um, because it's interlinked with cognitive development. So you can try to look at the age. It's pretty similar right there. So it's interlinked, right? So from birth to two years old, uh, that's when children do, um, they play alone, so we can call it solitary play where they're playing alone, or it can also be guided by adults. And from birth to two years, that's an important time of a child's development because that's when they make sense of um, their own body as well as the world around them. That's when they um, interact, learn about the interaction between them and the environment. And they build on different skills that are important and that is required as a foundation before they work on, uh, for example, pretend play skills. So from zero to two years is really important part of a child's development to develop different skills. So later on, we'll be talking about the types and I'll be going through in more detail what are the skills that the child will learn in different types of activities. All right, so let's look at birth. So at birth, it's more of caregiver play where the child is, so there's not much movement, right? They're still um, maybe in the crib, they're just looking at the adults, uh, and the adults is going very near them to um, give um, give them some some modeling. Um, so they might be imitating some facial expression. They might do some um, vocalizing as well using their voice, and then um, their actions become more purposeful. So just now we talked about cause and effect, right? Where they have more focused actions to get a response. So that's the link right there, where their actions become more purposeful. And that's when they start to interact with the adult. And at around five months, they do people object play, where they can share attention on toys, but with the support from adults. So the adults still supporting them to have that joint attention to the same object so that you can talk about the object, um, you can model the language about the object, show them the different ways of manipulating the object. And then around nine months, children uh, start to show uh, and share their toys. So they'll be holding up toys, they offer the toys to get a response from adults. So for example, this ball right here, the child might um, hand it to the, the adult and the adult might put it on a ball run and then it rolls down. So uh, they really like that effect of the ball rolling down and they might hold it up again so that the child, uh, so that the adult do it again. So there's a lot of showing, there's a lot of sharing, or they might put it on the ball run and go down and they go, ah! to share that engagement with the adult. And at around 18 months, that's when they do joint interactive play with adults. So they are learning. So they are developing that turn taking skill now. They are taking turns with adult in simple play. So for example, I roll the ball down, then their turn to roll the ball down. Um, they might imitate action. So the, the parent clap and they clap, the parent um, bang, uh, tap on the table and the child tap on the table. The adults, for example, model a sound like ah, and the child goes ah, or different facial expression. So that's when they do a lot of imitation and turn taking and joint interactive play with adults. And at around two to two and a half years, 
So this is the time, so two to five, where they start to um, develop skills to learn to play with other children. So birth to two, playing alone or playing with adults. And from two onwards, then they start to develop skills to play with other children. So they might start by just watching children play, maybe watch from a distance, but not joining in yet. So that's called onlooker play, where they're just looking from the side and observing from the side. So they might show interest in um, other children in the sense that they are observing them, observing their movement, observing what they're playing, but they are not joining in yet. Um, and then after that, they start to play alongside but not with other children, meaning that they might be sitting side to side with the child or sitting in the same room as the child, um, but they are still not playing together. So that's called parallel play. So they are sitting in parallel with the child, with the other child, but not playing together yet. And around three years old, that's when they do associative play, where they are already sharing the toys with uh, another child. So for example, if there's lots of Lego blocks, they might share that, that set of Lego blocks together, but they are still pursuing their own ideas. So the child might be using the same set of blocks, but one child is building a tower, another child might be building a bridge, let's say. And around four years old, that's when they start to do cooperative play, where they learn to play cooperative with their peers, learn that negotiating skills with their peers, that social interaction, and to follow rules in play. So the picture right there, no, no, we need to build the tower up, up till the end, we're gonna put the triangle on top, that's the roof, and then, only then, we can push it down. We're going to build the castle first, then we're going to build the airport control tower. So. It's about um, following the rules in play. So now that we have gone through uh, the play stages or so the cognitive and social play stages, let's look at the different types of play activities that we can do with children. So there's six different types of play that we're going to talk about today. Uh, this include gross motor, fine motor, sensory motor, visual perceptual, auditory, and pretend play. So the first five right here is the one that I talked about, that, that segment where there's um, birth to two years old, that age right there, that age range right there. Um, children need to learn all these skills during that first two years. Um, as a foundation and to as a foundation to also build on the pretend play skills later. All right, so let's first look at gross motor. So gross motor activities can be, for example, playing in the playground, whether it's outdoor or indoors. Um, and gross motor require whole body movement. So it involves movements of larger muscles. So our arms, our legs, our torso, so our body, our core. Um, and this time uh, for gross motor activities, it's, um, it's important because it's a skill that children need to use to perform everyday activities, be it at home, at school, or in the community. And by the time children reach two years of age, almost uh, almost all children are able to stand up, to walk and run, to walk up the stairs. So things like um, climbing up and sliding down, they really need to figure out, oh, where do I put my body? So I'm working on my, on my leg muscles. I'm going to push myself up as I climb. Um, where do I put my hands? where I need to put my bum down and my legs in front before I slide down. So things like that, they, they have to learn. So those are gross motor activities. And as large, large muscles develop, so the gross motor part develop, then children develop coordination of the smaller muscles, 
like muscles in their hands, their fingers, and also with their eyes. So those are fine motor skills. So some activities, so some fine motor activities include um, things like, for example, this girl right here using the tongs to uh, take the apple up. Um, so things like uh, moving the beach round, um, putting in the shapes into the shape sorter. So they have to be able to grasp onto the shapes and all the Lego blocks right here. So let's say if it's a shape, um, they have to grasp onto it. They have to manipulate it, try to figure out how it fits. So all of those things are building onto their um, fine motor skills. So they have to visually look at um, where they're putting it, how, how the shape is like, and then using their hand and their finger muscles to grasp onto it, to manipulate it, take it out, put it in. So all these skills, um, so fine motor skills are important to enable functions uh, such as writing, cutting, um, even things like fastening clothing, so button up your shirt, or when you're zipping up your jeans, uh, taking off shoes or putting on shoes, all those require fine motor skills. And now let's look at sensory motor. So sensory motor is basically incorporating both the motor part and the sensory part. So apart from, just now we talk about gross, so motor skills, we talk about gross motor, fine motor. Um, now we are incorporating the sensory part as well. So the children are processing the different senses from the environment. Um, while doing the movement. So this girl right here, putting her hand, kneading the dough, that movement right there, working on the motor skills, um, but also sensing that, um, that cue, that how, how the dough feels like. Is there any smell to the dough? Um, is it sticky? Is it slimy? So this one in the water and there's a, uh, maybe jellies inside and there's different textures. Um, this one, um, the sand and the rock might have different textures as well. And then they grabs onto the rock, they might find something inside, they're using their fine motor skills, but also using, incorporating that sensors and processing that sensors um, from their environment. And also swimming pool, um, although there's movement maybe in the water, when I'm on the slide, I feel like it's cold, um, so different senses. I can hear other children um, uh, screaming. I can hear splashing of water, um, things like that. So incorporating the sensory part and the motor part. So that's sensory motor play. Another one is visual perceptual play. So um, for visual perceptual, it's not the same as visual equity in the sense that visual equity is how clearly a person sees. But visual perceptual is how our brain makes sense of what the eyes see. So when we look at something, um, for example, uh, this girl right here completing the puzzle, so whether it's a whole puzzle piece or um, puzzle pieces to make a full complete picture, uh, whether it's scanning and see which one matches based on the different attributes. So this B right here has a sunglasses, so this one match, there's a green um, wings and they have to match that, they have to scan that, make sense of it, make sense of the pattern. So the Lego block right here, make sense of the pattern. I need to put red here and blue here, green here, yellow here. And when they are making uh, that pattern and understanding that pattern, understanding what they see and make sense of it, um, that is an important skill to learn because uh, it's important for things like um, for example, spelling, where they are identifying patterns of how to write the different letters and the alphabet. So B goes like this, D goes like this, 
um, writing. So like combining different letters to make up the words. I need to put this word right here, the letter right here, and then this letter right here, this letter right here, combine it together to make a word, to make a full complete uh, word. So it's like putting the puzzle pieces into a full complete picture. So that's some sort of link right there. So if you want to know more detail about this, um, the, just for your information, if you um, have not heard of it before, um, so gross motto normally we do work with, um, so mostly the physiotherapist will do it and um, fine motor, visual, perceptual and the sensory part uh, normally, we will collaborate with OTs as this their yeah, areas of expertise. I love um, physiotherapists and OTs. Um, they are the best in all these things, and they do help us to um, to work on all these skills that are important for later on when we are working on like reading and writing and even language. So another type of play is auditory play where uh, the child be it um, using musical instruments or musical toys or um, things at home so pots and pans you can bang it make different sounds so the child is processing different sounds from the environment they are trying to make sense of it they are aware of the sounds process it there's different types of sounds in their environment and then slowly they develop awareness of the different types of speech sounds and then start to learn those sounds. The next one, let's look at pretend play. So pretend play, um, as we mentioned before, the research has shown that pretend play, so symbolic play has correlation to language development. That's why we try to do a lot of pretend play in session as well. Um, it works on really a lot of skills like language skills, social skills. Children learn also to look at things from other people's perspective as they role play. So um, they develop the theory of mind. So for example, oh, they can talk about the mental state words like, oh, the baby is hungry, he's crying. Oh dear, what should we do? We should feed him. Oh, this girl right here is sad because she's, she doesn't have a turn. Um, what should we do? So things like that where we can talk about um, something that is familiar to the child. We talk about the mental state, what, how the person is feeling, what the person is thinking, uh, reasoning skills, um, problem solving skills, what do we do next? Um, how do we solve the problem? So. We work on different skills through pretend play. And pretend play has different themes as well. So we can work on, um, for example, uh, doll play, uh, doctor play. We can do um, pretend play with food, so like cooking. Um, we can do with vehicles as well. And also settings that are familiar with the child, like going to the playground, and then we can role play that way. So. When we look at pretend play, remember the table that we that I showed you just now? Um, we start with simple actions first, with familiar objects, and then we slowly extend. So now that we have gone through the stages and types of play, let's look at the five key components to think about to help us guide um, and support uh, a child's play development and play skills. So we have talked about the research showing that around 12 months here, right? 12 months where that where children start to do symbolic play. And that's where um, that's that correlation right there where they start to have their first words. So when they do symbolic play, that's when they start to do uh, to have their first words emerging. And that's why we look at play skills in speech therapy sessions. So um, the child really need to understand that language is abstract, like when they do object substitution in pretend play, 
the object can be whatever they want to be. So it's abstract. So there's a link there, there's a correlation there. So uh, we notice that there's a gap uh, between after the child do cause and effect, then um, helping them to develop pretend play skills. Uh, we find that there's a gap there. And normally we start to build on those play skills if we notice that's, that is the, the challenges that the child has. Right? So how do we build play skills? So today, I think my main point is that we are talking more on the pretend play portion of it and how to build that because we know that pretend play is correlated to language development. So how do we build on play skills, sorry. Um, so first of all, I want you to think of um, play as if it's like a musical play. So if you've never been to a musical uh, play before or musical theater, um, think of it as if it's like a, you're going to the cinema for a movie. Right, so first of all, what do you need? First, we need to set the stage. We need to set the stage for the play. First, we need space. So we need well-defined space. We also need time and we need materials. So let's look at space first. So like when you're going to a play, you either go to the theater, you go to the cinema. So that's your space. So for children as well, when they are playing, you have to set up a play area um, for them to play, be it at home or at school. We do set a corner as a play area. Um, time. So you can start with so younger children who are still trying to develop uh, pretend play skills. Maybe you can start with around 20 to 30 minutes. Then as they grow older and have, um, or they start to develop longer um, play sequences, then they can extend that time, maybe go around 50 minutes to an hour. So let's look at materials. So when you go to a play, there's props, right? So when children are playing, they also need their resources, they need materials. So what kind of materials can we use? So for children who are doing early pretend play, uh, as we mentioned before, um, that functional play right there, that's the emergence of pretend play. We can use realistic objects. So things like every, anything that's around your environment. So cups, uh, phone, key, so realistic objects. Um, and when they are sequencing more uh, play sequence, then we can use more open-ended objects. So things like Legos are good, blocks. Uh, so basically you're thinking of things that you can kind of put together to make up different things. So like blocks and Legos are good because uh, you can actually make it into different things. Like I can make it in a car, I can make it in a tower, I can make it to whatever I want it to be. So it's open-ended, it's based on the child's imagination. So in the classroom, normally we encourage a mixture of different objects. Uh, so the realistic objects, um, different toys, open-ended objects and different toys with different themes. So you want a variety of themes. So you, you can do vehicles, animals, and different kind of animals as well, sea animals, farm animals, zoo animals, even dinosaurs. Um, we can do transport, we can do um, doll, figurines, um, cooking, so like food. So food-wise, you have fruits, you have vegetables, you have meat. So there's different, different um, themes. You can even have your own uh, themes based on events, like uh, maybe a, so Christmas is coming, so a Christmas, Christmas theme, let's say. Yeah. So now that we talk about setting the stage already, let's look at the five key components um, to consider to build play skills. 
So first of all, we want to follow your child's lead. So when you go to a play, what do you need first? You need a director. And what did we mention before at the beginning of the slide? Let your child direct the play. So they are the director of the play. All right? When they direct, it encourages initiation and it develops metacognitive skills as well. So they have their own idea, they de develop their own imaginative skills and creativity. And also by following their lead, we are being sensitive to their interests and also their emotion. And that's very important because when we are attuned to them and their emotion, it helps with social bonding and it helps with self-regulation as well. Um, and as you connect with them, it also builds trust. And that's when we can guide and scaffold their learning to, um, to support building up whatever skills they're working on. Without that trust, it's, it's very hard for us to be engaged with them and for them to trust us to guide them. So we really need to uh, go into their world first, follow their interests, follow their lead. All right, remember the child has to be the director. After having the director there for the play, what else do you need for a play? So we need a script. What is the play about or what is the movie about? We need to have a theme. So for young children, um, the theme, the script can be um, made up of daily routines, so routines at home, routines in school, or personal experience, like for example, if they just had their birthday or even like family events. So those are the play scripts that you do with your child. So at home you have um, let's say you wake up and then what do you do throughout the day? You wake up and you shower, then you eat, then you go to school. So that is their play script. And for older children, it can be play scripts from, for example, books. So stories like they can role play stories like Three Little Pigs, Red Riding Hood, um, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. So um, it's more abstract, it's more out of their routine um, and it can be from TV shows as well. So I personally have this um, kid that I'm working with that love Thomas and he has been telling me the, the best stories ever about Thomas and his friends and the different adventures that they are going to. And in that sense, when they are, when he's playing, I'm also I can also help him with um, narrating his stories and building on his language uh, and narrative skills. So TV shows is one for older children, um, and it can be from their imagination as well. So anything from going up to outer space, um, a dragon. Uh, invading or uh, attacking a castle, whatever they want it to be. So the possibilities are endless. So um, secondly is to recognize play scripts. Now that we have the director, the script, we have the story theme, we have the main idea. So you have the synopsis already. What else do you need? So you have the synopsis. Now we need to know the sequence of events. So to act out the sequence of events. So we have to recognize play sequences. So just now I talked about uh, for younger kids, let's say we are working on daily routines. So familiar sequence. You can wake up, you brush your teeth, you go eat and then you play and all that. So we start with familiar sequence first. So for example, if you want to take on uh, the sequence of the child eating, you can do things, you can demonstrate play actions like uh, when you're preparing food, first you have you cut the um, bread and then you put on the 
plate, and then uh, the bear eat it, let's say. So that's three different play sequence. And slowly they will extend it to maybe opening up a restaurant where you have different food or going to the beach for a picnic. So um, you start with one sequence first and then slowly add on or wherever the child is at and then slowly extend it. So, oh, and you can expand or extend. So when you expand it, for example, you cut the bread, then you cut uh, the different fruits, the different food. So you're still doing the same thing, but you're expanding to different items. When you're extending, you're extending to, after I cut, then I'm going to put on the plate. After I put on the plate, then I'm going to feed the doll. So you can expand and extend the play sequence. And when you are doing that, use emotions, your voice, your face, show expression, and your body. So things like when you're cutting, so let's say I'm cutting the apple right here, I just don't go, oh, cut apple. That's not fun at all. So I'll do things like, oh, ah, cut, cut apple. Mmm, yummy apple, yummy apple in my tummy. Yum, yum. Eat. Apple is spoiled. No, don't want apple. So I'm using my facial expression, my body, my voice. Um, oh dear, I'm so sad. My apple just dropped. I don't have anything anymore. So I'm talking about emotions. I'm using that tone of voice to show my emotion as well. So to demonstrate emotions, voice, facial expression, exaggerate it as much as you can so that the child is also interested in that um, and use your body. And when you're also exaggerating what you are doing, your tone of voice, your facial expression and all, um, you're also encouraging your child to imitate you. So you can first model it and pause. So for example, um, so first of all, get your own toy. So if the child is holding a knife to cut a certain food, you are also holding a knife and cut the food to model it for them. So get your own toys and then you action it out for them when you're eating mm, and then you pause and look at them so you're not just waiting but you're pausing and looking at them expectantly waiting for a response and if they're not imitating you you can model it again um, or you can give them some cues like oh bobby eat apple then get them to eat it um, visually show them, oh, apple, cut apple. So getting them to, um, encouraging them to cut as well, to imitate you cutting the, the fruit. Um, or you can even use hand over hand uh, prompts where you are holding the child's hand and trying to get them, um, guide them to cut together. And we want to repeat the play sequence and talk about it. So we have to repeat multiple times, repeat and bombard them with the same um, model of the sounds, the words, the actions. So lots of repetitions. So we are looking at, for example, words I would encourage you to do around three to five of the same words that you're targeting in one interaction. Mmm, cut, mm, cut apple, mmm, yummy apple. Oh, apple finish. I need more apple. Let's cut more apples. So I'm repeating multiple times of the word apple in that interaction. So we re in terms of play, you repeat the sequence as well. You cut the apple, then you cut the cucumber, you cut um, the watermelon. So you're repeating it for them to see and, and to follow as well. And you want to watch your child's responses. So you want to be attuned to your child. Remember, they are the director, so we can model for them, but we also want to be attuned to them. So watch their responses. If they're showing like, mm, they are not so interested in it, what can we do to adapt, to gain their interest? Maybe they're not so interested in food. Maybe they're interested in the ball. So let's follow their lead and then we can model to them how to use the ball. So I can throw the ball, I can roll the ball. 
I can put the ball on the ball run and let it slide down. So there's different ways that you can do this. Um, so it's really important to watch your child's responses and adapt accordingly and respond accordingly based on their reactions. So now that we have gone through, uh, you have your director there, you have your script, you have your sequence. Now we have to scout for actors in the movie, right? We have to scout for actors in the play. So who's going to act out the role? So in order to act out the role, we have to act out the character. So we need to join in the child's role play. So when we join in uh, the child's role play, so for example, the child um, might be role playing uh, the lion, let's say, and we are role playing someone else, we are actually helping the child understand what character, what the character is thinking and what the character is feeling. And that's when they can learn how to take, um, to understand from different perspective, for, to understand from other people's perspective. And that's when they develop the theory of mind. And we also want to encourage decentralization. So decentralization meaning that we are actually um, getting away from us as a, to, to actually decentralize to involve a doll-like object. So we let the doll do different things and we model the doll's thoughts and emotions and we model what the, the doll might say in a certain situation. And last but not least, we have to narrate the play. So when we narrate the play, we are saying, so, you know, in a play, you have a narrator, right? Like once upon a time, there's four people that, going, that are going to see the wizard or whatever it is. So um, you want to narrate the play. So in terms of playing with your child, you're actually actually narrating what you are doing. So when you're, you're cutting the apple, you're actually show, telling them that you're cutting that. So cut apple, eat apple. And then um, you're also narrating what the child is doing. So um, Bobby eat apple, mm, yummy apple. When they're pretending to eat the apple, then you can model that sound and the word. So that's... Um, modeling what the child is doing. And you can also model what the doll might say. So just now we talk about decentralization where we involve an, the doll or any other figurines. And we can talk about what the doll might think, what the doll might say, how the person feel, um, what's happening to the doll. So the doll fell down, oh dear, she's feeling sad, ouchie. It's very painful. Um, we can also describe how the doll looks like. Um, and that's kind of build um, the language skills as well as social interaction skills through play. So we have to narrate the play. So that's the five key components. So do you remember all of them? Exam time right now. So. First, we have to follow the child's lead. So let them be the director of the play. And after having the director, we have to have our play script. So we have to recognize the play script. What are we going to do? Like what theme are we going to do with the story? What's the main idea of the story? What's the main idea of the play? And we have to recognize play sequences, right? We can start with a simple sequence and then build on we have to join in to the role play. So either you role playing it or you use a doll like object. And lastly, narrate the play. So today we have gone through quite a lot. We have talked about the importance of play and why it's important because children learn through play. And we have talked about the different stages and types of play. And most importantly, we have to start from our child's le level and then build on from there and also follow their interests. So start from what they're interested in, what toys they're interested in, and then scaffold from there. And we have also talked about the five key components to consider uh, in order to support their play. All right, so now let's 
uh, that's the end of the, the webinar. So we'll be spending some time uh, to answer some of the questions that you have sent in. Thank you. Okay, everyone, um, thank you so much for um, your time with the presentation. I hope uh, you all had a great time learning. Um, there's a lot of information I know and we are overrunning a little bit. Uh, so now we'll answer a couple of questions here. Um, all right, um, let me see. Okay, someone has asked, um, Hold on, let me look at all the... Wow, there's quite a few questions. So let me have a look at this. Because of running out of time, we'll just um, do a quick one. All right, okay. We'll just answer two questions. Uh, I may just answer the questions. All right. Okay, so the first question is, when can we start teaching a child to do uh, pretend play? All right, um, I think Jane has mentioned about the developmental stages. So once your child um, has start their first word at about 12 months old, that is when they have an idea of a symbol. And there's a good time to teach the pretend play. So for example, your child may take a pen and then put it to the ear as a, as a phone. So that's when you start to know that, oh, my child actually has got an understanding of symbols, symbolic. And the child may have the first word to tell you like things like a uh, phone or ball. And that is a good time to progress on the pretend play. All right, another question here is, um, what are some of the toys that we will use for pretend play? Um, okay, some of the things that we usually use during, uh, for pretend play in our sessions, we have things like a cooking set. So that's when, because that's something that the child is really familiar with, cooking toys, um, fruit cutting, um, put in the pot and cook, pour tea into a cup and drink, and then you wash up. Um, so we have cooking set. We also have birthday cakes. Um, kids really like that. Like it's a, it's a fun and joyous occasion. So they learn things like um, I put on the candles, I'll light them up, and then I'll sing a song and I'll cut them. Yeah, we also use doctor sets a lot because that's something they might be familiar with when they go for medical appointments. We have stethoscopes, we have syringes, yeah, we have uh, thermometers, and we also play with uh, trucks for the boys or animals. These are all good themes to start with for pretend play. Yeah, so, all right. Okay, because we are running out of time, so I think we will end the, the, the webinar here and we'll see you tomorrow for our second webinar for this series. Tomorrow we are talking about oral motor. So we'll go through the different stages of oral motor development and some of the exercises in our oral motor program that we often do. All right, see you tomorrow. Bye.